So if you've been watching the news lately, you've probably seen photographs like this. Students protesting because their government is cutting subsidies to education. And a big part of the reason for this, both the government's cutting subsidies and the student outcry, is that getting a college education just doesn't cost what it used to. So if you graduated more than two decades ago, you might be surprised to know that it now costs students over two and a half times as much as it did for you. And that's in real dollars for any economists in the audience here. And it's not an easy problem. On the one hand, the cost is becoming harder for both students and governments to bear. But on the other hand, employers are demanding an educated workforce. They want employees with complex analytical skills. The world now runs what, out of what we dig out of people's brains, not just what we dig out of the ground. And so that's the problem. Now, what's the fix? Well, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I have no idea. But what I do want to suggest is that maybe we've been looking in the wrong place. We've been expecting change to come from schools and governments. But what if the change came from us? I'd like to share my story and suggest that maybe an education doesn't need to be expensive. And what's more, maybe we can learn better without it. So in my case, I was lucky. When I got accepted to college, I managed to narrow down my choice of major to two choices, business and computer science. I was really interested in both. With one, you get to build companies. With the other, you get to build technologies. And the two certainly aren't mutually exclusive. After all, Bill Gates was a hacker before he built an empire. But at my school, I could only major in one. So I did what any freshman would do and did a careful, rational cost-benefit analysis. <laughs> so business it was. And after graduating, I have no regrets. I learned a lot and I had a great time. But after finishing my education, I had this longing for the path not taken. I really wanted to learn computer science. But going back to school didn't appeal to me. Four more years of my life, acceptance boards, tuition bills. I didn't want to postpone my life and rack up debt just to pursue a curiosity. I wanted the education, not the school. It was about then that I remembered that universities like MIT, Stanford, and Harvard had the habit of putting up classes online for free. I've done a few of these before, and the thought occurred to me, if you could learn a class, why not an entire degree? So that was the beginning of an experiment. Would it be possible to get an MIT education in computer science without ever going to MIT? So it's an intriguing idea, but already you can probably notice some of the complexities and objections this might raise. So going to MIT is a lot more than just what you learn in the classroom. So how can you possibly hope to replicate something which is such a multifaceted experience? So I like to think college is a lot like eating at a five-star restaurant. You're never paying for just the food. You get the wait staff, the elegant decor, and the fancy French wines. You're paying for a complex and multifaceted experience. And the same is true at college. You get networking with your intellectual peers, research opportunities, and credentials from elite institutions. And like the fancy restaurant, you get a big bill at the end. And you know what, sometimes this system works. But just as you probably don't want to go to a five-star restaurant every time you get hungry, you probably also don't want to go back to school every time you want to learn something. I didn't want the five-course meal. I wanted my education a la carte. And so what mattered most to me was being able to understand the big ideas of computer science, things like algorithms, artificial intelligence, encryption, and the internet, and being able to implement those ideas in computer programs. So I decided to make my challenge simple. My goal would be to try to pass the exams an MIT student would do and to do the programming projects. I admit it's a simplification. It omits a lot of the MIT experience. But for what I wanted to get out of it, it was a pretty good simplification. And what mattered more, it was a simplification that worked. So I was able to build a curriculum of 33 classes that with one or two minor exceptions was identical to the course list an MIT student would use. And I was able to build this using only MIT's free online available information. The only cost was for a few textbooks, which meant I could follow this entire program for under $2,000. OK, so I have my goal, and now I have the material. Now for the hard part, actually learning MIT classes. I'm not kidding myself. MIT is a really hard school. It's notoriously difficult, even for bright students. And what's more, I'm not going to have the help of faculty and professors and classmates that I can easily get help from. So 
in theory, the project's doable, but would it just be too difficult in practice? And, and when I told my friends about this, that I was planning on doing an MIT degree on my own, they reinforced those doubts. They told me they couldn't imagine trying to learn an MIT degree on your own. It would just be too difficult without the constant guidance and support of faculty members. But that last point didn't ring true for me, because when I went to college, I was in lecture halls like this one, where the professor would give a talk to an auditorium full of 300 students. Yeah, sure, if I had a question, I could raise my hand. But if I really didn't understand something, it was up to me to learn it. So perhaps the doubts and worries over a do-it-yourself degree have more to do with it being unconventional than it being genuinely more difficult than a formal program. And as I started doing the first few classes, my results were even more surprising than that. I found I was able to learn faster using this approach than I ever had while in university. So far from being an obstacle, it turned out that not going to MIT had made my job a lot easier. Okay, so that last bit deserves a bit of an explanation. After all, an MIT student has access to everything I do and much, much more. How can I possibly have an advantage over a student when I have fewer resources? It, it defies common sense. So in order to explain this, I need to do a little bit of a detour. I need to go into the geeky realm of personal productivity. So there's a tool called a time log. And here's how the time log works. You jot down the starting and the stopping times for every activity you do. And I mean every activity from when you wake up in the morning to when you take out the garbage. Now my guess is that most of you here have never done a time log before because you can just imagine how irritating that is to do. But if you do one, the results can be eye-opening. So here's a recent Wall Street Journal article where the reporter did just that. She writes, I soon realized I'd been lying to myself about where the time was going. What I thought was a 60-hour work week wasn't even close. I would have guessed I spent hours doing the dishes when in fact I spent minutes. I spent long stretches of time lost on the internet or puttering around the house, unsure exactly what I was doing. Now, because I'm a huge geek, I've done time logs before, and I can say the situation is even worse for students. The vast majority of time a student spend isn't spent learning. It's spent commuting to class, uh, copying notes at Starbucks, and trying to stay awake in lectures. If you could total up the amount of time that a student spends forming new insights and remembering facts, which is, of course, what learning is, it would be tiny. And for the most part, this isn't even students' fault. After all, entrepreneurs often notice a startling difference in their productivity at a startup versus a big firm. Big institutions mean bureaucracy. They mean paperwork. They mean doing what you're told instead of what's important. So being an educational entrepreneur can therefore offer some learning advantages over people in a formal system. So take lectures as a perfect example. So when I would do MIT lectures, when I started doing the classes, I would watch them at one and a half times the speed. Now, this may sound very difficult, but the difference is barely audible in human speech. And of course, if it goes too fast, you just hit rewind. Students in a regular classroom don't have access to a fast forward or rewind button, even though I'm guessing most of them would like one. And the impact of this isn't trivial. By being able to watch lectures at a slightly faster pace and watching them sequentially, I was able to take classes that normally span four months and watch them in two days of real time. Or take assignments. Students do assignments because they have to. Yes, sometimes they facilitate learning, but sometimes they don't. For example, if you're struggling with a concept, why wait weeks to get your answers back? When I would do hard MIT assignments, I would do the questions with the solution key in hand, one question at a time. Because it's tight feedback loops like this that cognitive scientists recognize as being critical to learning. And you don't need to be a genius to apply these ideas either. Being able to replay key segments of lectures, being able to get immediate feedback on your skills, these are structural advantages that benefit slow learners as much as they benefit fast ones. So where am I right now? Well, as of this moment, I've completed 20 of the 33 computer science courses in the MIT curriculum. And by completed, I mean that I've passed those final exams and I did the programming projects associated with those classes. And what's more, because of speed ups like this that I've mentioned, I'm on track to finishing the program in 12 months instead of four years. So today the big topic is about how technology is going to change educational institutions and classrooms. I think this misses the point. The big upheavals in education aren't going to be about schools. They're going to be about students. And I'm not alone in believing this. There's already grassroots organizations looking to rethink education, not from the top down, but from the bottom up. 
These are movements, they're not planned by schools or governments, but from students who are fed up with the limited options the current system provides. Education hacking is the new trend. So billionaire investor Peter Thiel now gives a $100,000 scholarship to students, not to go to school, but to drop out and start something interesting. And so when the best and brightest and most motivated start signaling their talent by not going to school, the rest of the world will take notice. And it's not an all or nothing proposition either. Jay Cross, the founder of the do-it-yourself degree, is putting together a list of universities based on the number of transfer credits they accept. That means you can go to a real university and get a real degree, but minimize the amount of time you have to spend learning in the classroom. Look, I get it. Maybe you don't want to go to MIT or try to learn an MIT degree on your own just for fun. I get that. But even if you decide to do your education the old-fashioned way, this still impacts you. The world is changing too fast to believe that learning stops once you get your diploma. Being able to teach yourself complex skills and big ideas is going to be essential to stay ahead. And so, like it or not, most education in the future is going to be self-education. Universities aren't going away anytime soon. They will always offer things self-education will miss. And they're a great experience, even if they're sometimes an expensive one. But that said, I believe self-education is the future. If a person like me can learn an MIT degree in one quarter of the time and one one hundredth of the financial cost, what's to stop you from doing it too? Thank you.